Good afternoon, everybody. Today I want to welcome to Freedom Revival Semester on FMSR Index Radio. And coming to you today, I want to speak to you a little bit on God's Word today. Uh, I'm going to give you a scripture to start off our, uh, our sermon today. And uh, if you would, everybody get their Bibles together and turn to Isaiah 30 and 1. Isaiah 30 and 1. Today's sermon is going to be entitled, A Rebellious House. Isaiah 30 and 1 says, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord. Take counsel, but not of me, and a cover with a covering, but not of my spirit that they may add sin to sin. I want to know how many today believe that we have a merciful God. How many today believe that God knows all and sees all? What about a God that heals your heart and heals your uh, wounds that have been sent against you? that have been marked down against you? What about the ones that are not just physical, but the wounds that have been brought on to you by a spiritual warfare or by a loved one that's hurt you dearly in the past or uh, a brother or a family member or a friend? How about, how many of you believe that Jesus Christ came and lived on, on this earth for 33 years and was tempted and was tried and was put to a, uh, to a cross on Mount Calvary so that you and I may have an eternal life. Today we serve a God. We serve that God. The God of the Bible. The God that has endured for all ages. Jesus Christ is not a God, just a good God. He's not just a merciful God, but He's also a healing God. He's a loving God. He's the one that has seen all your torment and your trials and your tribulations. But we need to know that we serve a God that is unchanging. He's just. He's wrathful. And he's jealous. He doesn't like to have any other kind of gods that are ever put before him. He doesn't like the fact that we go out and we dabble in this and dabble in that in the world as Christians. He doesn't like to see it when good Christians fall away and become backslidden. You see, Jesus Christ wants us to be in his fold, in his number, out there doing his will and his way. We have a short time while we're here on this earth, and we need to use it wisely. And we have to understand that faith will get us just so far. We have to understand that it's God's Word, not what Mama and Papa told you, not what your brothers and sister told you, not what Dad and Mom taught you, but what God's Word actually says is what's going to endure and take you all the way to heaven. See, you've got to understand that it was in the beginning, and it will be in the end. It will be everlasting from beginning to end. But the, the, the Word of God will get you all the way to heaven if you walk in it, if you talk with it, if you eat it and take it within your heart and you let it be inscribed and so into the walls of your heart that you, when, when you open up your mouth that your tongue will want to lavishly speak about Jesus Christ, about how good and wonderful He is, but how strong He is and how far against sin He is. See, we have to live it every day. We've got to let it get into our place in our lives that our hearts 
are set on Jesus Christ. And the first thing that, I, that is in our mind and in our hearts of the morning is Jesus Christ. And the very last thing in our mind should be Jesus Christ. See, we've got to be in that place in our world because our world is a sinful place. A place that has easily taken down some of the strongest saints that ever walked the face of the earth. Satan has many wiles in this world that he can come against you on. Things that you would never dream that would come against you, like your family, your loved ones, your children, your husband or your wife, your mother or your father. All these different kinds of things. Or a complete enemy, a complete stranger may become your complete enemy. In our lives, we have to stop looking over the fence roll where we believe that the grass is always greener and remember what is good and just in our lives today. Today we're going to hear about someone that had allowed all that he had been taught in his youth from his father to be led to, to have been able to allow himself to get to a place where he'd been led away, led astray from the things today you're going to know about, no doubt, that this man in this sermon today had heard the voices crying out, look at that. Look how good and sweet that looks. How delicious that food looks over there. How much better than it is than in, in your father's house. Look at them good looking girls. Look at how good that guy looks. Look over there and see what that tastes like in that wine or in that, or in that food. You see, the devil has all kinds of ways to be talking to you. No doubt he'd heard the words from his friends and the demons within his head and in his heart swirl about and those voices kept telling him, come on out, come out to play. Come out to a place to where we can enjoy the way. No doubt. That's what he heard before he asked his father to go out, to give him his partaking uh, uh, or his, his uh, birthright so he could go out and enjoy the world. This man was about to learn just how good he really did have it in his father's house, on his father's land and on his ways uh, that he had taught him and brought him up. But it's sometimes we have to learn some hard lessons in life so that we will understand what it is when we face the trials and temptations that come on in later in life. Turn with me to Isaiah 53 and 6 through 12. And I'm going to try to keep this as just as quick as I possibly can. But there's something I want you to really listen to here. Isaiah 53, 6 through 12. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one in his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He has oppressed, he was oppressed rather, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before her shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit. In his mouth. Now I want you to pay specific attention to this next verse. Verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. Then thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his land. He shall 
see of the tra travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteousness, my righteous servant, justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with, a great, with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he has numbered were the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. The prodigal son is much like most of the people in the churches today. The prodigal son was always looking on the other side for greener grass, better ways than what his father had, better better things than he could possess, but he knew that his father was going to give him the money to go out to do what he wanted to do. Because his father loved him, he wanted him to see the right from the wrong. But he hoped that all the things that he had taught his son would stay and, and, and dwell within his heart and his mind. He allowed the people around him and the voice in his mind and his heart to deceive what was truly important in his life. You see, all the things on the other side sometimes look so green, so good, so enticing, so lovable, so embraceable. There are a lot of lessons that we'll, uh, uh, we can be taken from the prodigal son, but the one I want to stay with today is where the prodigal son had become his own worst enemy. The prodigal son had it made where he was at. His father housed him, loved him, clothed him, gave him money, and gave him housing so that he would be comfortable in the love that he had. All the prodigal son had to do was obey his father's rules, work hard, do the things that he's asked to do, do the chores, keep up with his father's teachings. But like the church today, the prodigal son wanted something that was greener, easier, more manageable in his sin-filled thoughts. So he wanted out. He wanted to cross the fence to where the pastor the pasture was greener. The church wants a cross without sacrifice. The church wants the power of God without the knowledge of God. The church wants to be entertained like the world and live in the world without the barriers of the word of God. Without the teachings of God, they could guide them back into truth and reality. And they'll go about any way they can to destroy the minister that brings the true word of God and saying that he is just an old timer. He's one of those people who's too legalistic to live in the real world of the now. But that minister's got to stand, if he's really of God, he's got to stand in truth. And in the word of God, and he's got to cry out because it's their blood that's going to be on his hands when he comes before the judgment seat. How many of us know at church that the people, just like what I've talked about, how many know in the church world today, you might see them in church praising God one minute and then in the next sitting in the tattoo parlors telling a big nasty joke or standing on the street corner drinking a beer or going to the club and dancing and grinding up with a partner that's not their wife or their husband. How many knows that the church is condoning that kind of activities today and that the church world has gone astray from what God's standards are? They're more entertained and less restrained than ever before. Just like the prodigal son, they're looking over across 
the, into the greener pastures, or so they think it's greener. So the prodigal son decided to do what most sinful thought, thoughts of America and across the world do, and across the church world do today. They take their inheritance and they lump it up and stick it in their wallet or their checkbook or their plastic cars and, at cards and they go out into the world and begin to have fun and run to and fro. They have no rules and no regulations on their lives. They pay attention more to what's being uh, written in Time magazine than in what's in the Word of God. But you see that inheritance that we have from our Father, which is in heaven, which art in heaven, is something not to be trifled with. And you see, with all that wonderful indulging that the, that the prodigal son was doing, just like the world is today, sooner or later he found himself stuck somewhere he didn't want to be. He found himself homeless without money, without food, and then eating slop out of the pigsty. No doubt he was filthy. His life was in disarray. And he found himself dreaming of that wonderful food that his father had. That warm, comfortable bed. And longed to think that he would even be, if he could just be in the servant's house and do the servant job, it would be okay. Because he now understood that the world, it might look great. It might look green. It might give you a wonderful set of pleasures for the moment. But when it all comes down to it, God's house is the place to be where the truth never changes, the love never goes away, hate is never within your reasoning that comes from the Father. And he kept thinking, that prodigal son kept thinking, would my father even allow me back into the house? Would he accept him for who he had become? The prodigal son knew his choices in the world was sinful and had placed him into the horrible place that he had found himself slopping with the pigs. He knew he was not worthy of even going back and sleeping in his father's house or probably even laying on the same land that his father had no doubt set up for him and his brother. As he sat there in the muck and the mire, he realized where he had sat in, in the sin and wallowing in the mud and the stench and the, and the, and the pig's uh, sty. He had found that place because of the place he allowed his heart and his mind and the demons within his head swirl and the voices drag him along. He had found himself slopped with the pigs because he became sin-filled and left his father's house. He understood it through it all. It wasn't his brother's fault. It wasn't his father's fault. It wasn't his neighbor's fault. It wasn't the, the servant's fault. It was his fault. God didn't put him in that place. His father didn't put him in that place. His brother didn't put him in that place. That servant didn't put him in that place. What put him in that place was the choices of the sin that he decided to take within his own heart and in his own mind and walk through that green pasture that soon come out to be nothing more than the stench of a pigsty. That's what he found when he left his father's house. Somebody today is having Jesus knocking on their heart. Is it you? I don't know. But I know this message is going out for somebody today that you've walked away from the father's house. But you've got to understand with the prodigal son, he come to the place that in his own understanding that he understood that it was the sin that drug him away from God. It was his own choices of 
grasping on and indulging himself in those sins that took him away from the Father's love and found him wallowing in the muck and the mire and the stench and the garb of the pigsty. As Jesus Christ followers, we've got to understand that we've got to call out the sin. We've got to wash the sin off of us and stand clear of the stench that no doubt other people will be able to see and understand and in the knowledge of, of our lives. If we're out here doing the things that are not of the Father, then you can guarantee that the sin and the demons that swirl about in this world is going to be talking in your head. It's going to be dragging your heart out and taking you away from the Father's house because you're going to allow it to have the hooks within you and drag you away from the house of God. Your Father's house is a place of refuge, a place of love, a place where we've got to understand that in time for us to stop being a rebellious child. That's where we've got to get to. We've got to get to this place to where we stop allowing the Satan's hooks being dug in within our hearts and our souls and our skin and dragging us out our doorsteps every day to partake of the world. We've got to get in a place so that we can stop allowing the ghosts of the world and our past to keep dragging us down. We've got to get to the place where we understand that the cross of Jesus Christ where he died was a place of freedom, not death. We've got to understand that in our Heavenly Father's house we have rest. We have the place to where we can, we can sink down into his word and we can eat and dwell in safety of the house of God. We can, we can be in the place where no longer the world can reach out and grab us and pull us in. But it's got to be you that recognizes that. It's got to be you that will get down on your knees and ask God forgiveness. We've got to get to a place where we stop blaming God for our mistakes. We've got to get uh, to a place where we begin to run back to God, back to the cross, where we can receive we can receive, we can receive forgiveness. We've got to stop taking everyone else's word for the knowledge of God and get dug into the word of God. And we've got to get dug in into the belief that God's word is inerrant. God's word is the place we've got to run to for refuge here on this earth. That's where God speaks to us. That's where God was dwelling. God is not only just dwelling in your heart and in your mind, but he dwells within that word. That word is everlasting. It was at the beginning and now it's going to be at the end. My friends, we're coming to a place to where we've got to understand the word of God is calling us out. He's calling us to be better than what the world is giving us today. We've got to get to a place where we've got to stop uh, taking God's word for what is real and what is happening in this world instead of what Grandpa told us, what uh, our fathers have told us, or what our mothers have told us, or what a complete stranger has told us on the TV. We've got to dig in and show ourselves approved. We've got to study the word because the word is what's going to help us understand who Jesus is and what Jesus can do for us. How Jesus can set us free and why it is that Jesus wants to set us free. We need to stop allowing the world to run our churches. We've got to stop allowing the world and its entertainment to enter into our churches. We've got to draw a line and say, hey, we've had enough of the world coming into our churches. If you want to come into our churches, leave the church or leave the world at the doors of the church. When you leave out of here, don't pick the world back up, but have Jesus Christ in your heart. If you're here today and you want Jesus Christ in your life and you don't want that sin in your world anymore, I know a place where you can run to. An altar right here before the world today is here waiting for you. Drop your burdens right here today. Aren't you tired of running from God? Aren't you tired of letting sin influence your life 
If you are, then right here's the altars. Right here today is where you can get rid of the sin that's washed over you and made you go out into the darkened world where you once thought those pastors were so much greater than they were. You can get rid of that sin from your life because you can get rid of it right here on the altars of the Word of, 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 the, of the church today. Allow Jesus to come into your heart and live within that temple. Understand that those pastors are not green over there anymore. If you backslid and you already know that those pastors are, and that grass across the fence is not greener. A matter of fact, it's turned into a dark and devilish place that's left you in the stench and the, and the muck and the mire of the pigsty. Allow him to show you that he's a caring God, a loving God, a just God. He wants to come into your heart, but you've got to open up the door because he's knocking at your doorstep or at your door. He's standing on your doorstep today. He wants you to be saved from an internal damnation, a lake of fire and brimstone. The weeping and the gnashing of the teeth is where you're going to land yourself after you die and leave this world. And if you don't leave that muck in the mire of the pigsty and step out, away from those deadly pastors that are across that fence. The only place you're going to live is in an eternal damnation. Jesus Christ wants to save you from that today. Are you ready? Are you willing to come out of those devilish places and set your foot on the firm foundation that is Jesus Christ, one that can call you a uh, and say, I am saved you. One that can wash away that muck in the mire and put you clean. And give you the wings of a snow white dove. So one day that you, when your name and your number is called, Jesus Christ can lift you up. And you can fly to the heavens. And rest forever with Jesus Christ. Are you ready? Are you willing to understand that you first got to stop looking across to the other pastors and look for the grass that is the truth, the truth in your Father's house? Come out to the Father's house. Come out into the world, out away from the world, rather, and get rid of the world. Go out into that world. Don't be a part of the world. Don't be a part of the world in the sin and the and the deceit. Be a part of Jesus Christ. Take Jesus to that place. Take Jesus out to minister into the, all of the nations of the world so that they too can have the opportunity to get rid of that sin, to be washed clean, so that they too can get the wings of that snow white dove, and so that he can give you rest so that you don't have to be weary any longer. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He loves you. Today, I want to give you an opportunity to, to be delivered. To be set free from that sin. Jesus Christ has that for you today. If you want to, if you understand what I've said today, Jesus Christ loves you. He desires to save your heart and your soul so that you can come up to heaven and be in him, in him and with Him and praise Him and serve Him. No longer to serve man. No longer to serve Satan. No longer a part of the world. No longer a partaker of the world. You might have to live here, but you don't have to partake of it. But Jesus Christ wants you to live an eternal life with Him. You have the opportunity, church, to be saved, to come out of the world. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you an opportunity to bow down wherever you're at, to kneel, to bow your head, to use that place to close your eyes and use that place as the opportunity to say, I am no longer of this world. Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. I believe in you, mighty Jesus. 
that you are the one that is going to wash me clean and accept me back. Mighty God, I give you all of my sins of who I am. And only you, church, only you, sinner, know what those sins are. Give them out to Jesus Christ. Lay them on this altar today. Lay them clean of you so that he can wash you clean from that stench of sin that you've been in. Jesus, I ask you, Lord, today, I know that somebody's going to hear this message. And when they hear this message, mighty God, that your word, your voice is sounding out to them. That knocking is getting louder and louder on their heart's door. That they can't ignore it any longer. That they know that you love them. That this world hates them. And all this world and Satan wants of them is to die and go to hell. But Jesus, you Lord, wants to give them an eternal life in heaven. Mighty God, I pray in your name, Jesus. Amen.